we are now ready uh, to start uh, an, another chapter for understanding better understanding the, the structure of web pages uh, which is uh, having more details uh, in studying the uh, cascading style sheets the css uh, that we already mentioned probably a thousand different times uh, so it's time to uh, start looking into them uh, this presentation will be divided in two parts uh, one uh, about the language itself uh, and the second about creating layouts and page layouts uh, with css okay let's start from um, the first uh, uh, approach to this uh, new uh, language um, and uh, we'll try to understand what are uh, the css in basic uh, and uh, how to use them for uh, the layout in the second part uh, so uh, how the, the app to apply the primitives that we saw we will see, we'll see in the first part finally we'll also have a look at the library uh, and framework uh, that will help us in uh, uh, developing uh, our uh, pages uh, saving us from the old details of creating every single element so this video is f uh, about the first part uh, so let's start uh, in uh, uh, having uh, a deep look uh, into the css structure and language uh, this is more or less the uh, the outline that will follow and uh, so we enter immediately into the definition of these uh, uh, cascading style sheets uh, where which they are not a new um, technology they are not new standards uh, you see the date uh, they date back to 1996 uh, so it's uh, 15 years uh, and they are, they are older than 15 years and uh, um, uh sorry 25 years and uh, uh, the first version and of course uh, uh, the um, the real popularity started with the uh, uh, x html or html4 uh, around uh, uh, 10 years ago the css 2.1 really gained enough power to be useful in actually uh, substituting all their practices uh, in, in developing websites so in the older time for aligning elements on a page on a web page we were using tables or frame sets some very old technology that, that, that is not used anymore and uh, because it was the only way then css from version 2 on uh, started to have enough primitives uh, to uh, be able to really lay out complex pages uh, only with css without uh, any strange quirks uh, or or, uh, or bad practices in the, um, at, this, at the HTML level. And right now we are in the uh, epoch of uh, CSS3. Uh, CSS3 is not a single standard, but it's a, a collection of modules that uh, um, evolve independently and uh, increase the, the power of CSS uh, and by, by adding new functionality. So again, what, what's happening is similar to what happened with HTML5, where uh, there will not be uh, future releases, but there will be a continuous development of the standard. The same is with CSS, so everything is founded on CSS2 uh, here, and uh, uh, some parts of CSS2, uh, for example, the selectors, evolved into a version 3 and a version 4. Uh, the definition of borders evolved into a new version, and the handling of images and so on, and new. So something that was already present in version 2 was evolved uh, with new uh, versions new, uh, new power say and some uh, new additions were made so for example multi-column grid layout uh, flexbox also uh, are being added to the, the kind of primitives that were already available in css2 and uh, you see that the the evolution of the different modules are not synchronized they evolve each at their own pace uh, following what are the requirements and uh, uh, so that the language is a, again a moving target uh, different technologies with different levels of support uh, and uh, um, by the different browsers uh, uh, but uh, it's a very flexible way for uh, for an evolving language and, and an evolving environment okay uh, so first of all the easy part is the syntax of css CSS is, is a rule-based language, so it's a, again CSS uh, programs or declarations are uh, text files, are text uh, files uh, that contains a set of contain a set of rules. Uh, so one CSS document, one CSS file contains one or more rules, and every rule is a statement about uh, 
the, some aspect of one or more HTML elements. So the rules declared in CSS, they apply to HTML elements. Hmm? So we are declaring rules that will apply to one or more elements on a page. A CSS document by itself does nothing. A CSS document only works if, it's, if and when it's applied to an HTML document, to the parse tree of an HTML document where it will, uh, it will identify elements and modify some aspects of them. Uh, I wrote that the aspects that we are going to modify are mainly the stylistic ones, but it's not a constraint. So that most of the attributes are stylistics, but not all of them. And uh, uh, how is a rule composed? The rule is very easy because it's composed of a selector and one or more declarations. A selector is just uh, one uh, um, expression that is able to select one or more HTML elements. So uh, we say that uh, it will modify something about uh, some HTML elements. Okay, which are these ones? Which are the HTML elements that will be affected? Well, the selector expression is used to select them. For example, the H1 selector uh, will select all the um, HTML elements of type H1, hmm? all the heading one uh, elements in the HTML page. And uh, to all of, all of these elements that have been selected, uh, then uh, the, the different declarations will be applied. And every declaration actually sets uh, one or more properties to some specific values. Hmm? Uh, so the syntax is very easy, one rule per line, let's say, selector, braces, and then uh, starting and closing brace, uh, and then the declarations inside. Uh, just to understand how it works, uh, let's have a look at one very simple HTML page. Uh, we don't care really about what's in this page, we see that there's a, there are two divs, uh, one table, uh, table row, table heading, table data, inside one, two, three, four table rows, and another div on the bottom that contains a link, and uh, the link uh, uh, it contains an image, for example. And there are also some emphasis, some italics here and there. Well, uh, a normal HTML fragment. Before thinking about what the CSS will do to this page fragment, we must first think at the parse tree of the page itself. So this is the tree structure of the same identical page. You see that there are uh, one div, an nested, nested div, a table with one, two, three, four rows, uh, and the rows have some headings and then data and so on. And there's a second div with an emphasis, with a link containing an image and so on. So this is actually the same document, but in tree format. So CSS rules are uh, rules that will apply to the parse tree of an HTML document. If we don't see the document as a tree, we won't understand how these, work, how these rules will work, okay? Uh, the rules will usually apply to an element, and then they can also uh, be inherited by the, all, all the elements contained in that one. So uh, we, we need to have very clear uh, in our mind what is the structure of the document uh, in tree format. Uh, so if we assume that HTML documents are trees, all the styles uh, usually are inherited along these trees and uh, uh, so we are not just matching one element with a rule we are matching one element and uh, going cascading through all the children of that element so what happens if i have a rule that applies to the body of the document the green one uh, well it should probably uh, tell us that uh, uh, whenever i apply something to the body uh, all the other nodes uh, that are children of body will also be uh, affected. But uh, if I have an H1 also, what happens? The H1 is, is a, a child of the body. So there, I uh, will have two rules, one that will apply to the whole document body and the second that will only apply to the H1. And uh, the H1 will have a conflict in a way because both the green rule and the red rule will apply to it. And uh, who wins? Well, there are uh, specific rules for, the, uh, for deciding which rules uh, um, win when uh, more than one rule applies to the same element. But first of all, maybe two, the two rules might just overlap and may not be in conflict. So maybe the green rule will set up the, the text color and the red rule will set uh, the font size. There's no conflict because they are set in different uh, 
properties of the objects so uh, the h1 element will have the text color as set by the body rule by the rule that applies to the body and the font size that is set by the rule that applies to h1 it's only in the case where the same property um, is matched uh, um, by different rules uh, uh, to the same element that we have, we have a conflict and so there are resolution rules uh, for deciding which rule to apply and this is the all the meaning of the cascading word in css there is a cascade of rules they are, they overlay one on top of the other and at the end we have uh, one rule for uh, the, um, deciding which who wins so for example in this example we had this uh, uh, body uh, for example all the body is uh, uh, setting a color for the text uh, so all the text will be green uh, while maybe h1 will be the only one uh, to be formatted in in the red color okay so uh, with this principle uh, the syntax uh, uh, of a css is uh, very simple as we said uh, is made of uh, um, selectors uh, and declarations a declaration may contain a declaration block may contain more than one uh, declaration and all of them must be included in curly braces they are mandatory they cannot be omitted uh, and each rule every rule itself uh, separates a property from a value we separate it with column so the syntax is braces columns for separating property and value semicolon for separating different declarations in the same declaration block so basically it's very very simple once i open the brace i can also uh, use more than one line I, i'm not forced to write everything in one line because the brace is just the limit the, the, the declaration block and then i have a closing brace down there so it's a very simple format for uh, declarations and uh, uh, declaration let, let you set some properties okay so we just have to learn uh what are the what's the meaning of the different properties of the different uh, uh, um, html elements hmm? uh, so a property is set to a given value the bad news is that uh, there are more than 200 properties i tried to list all of them here and it was feeling while uh, i was speaking um, and uh, many of them uh, are useful for uh, for uh, deciding some aspect of the page um so we'll try to have some uh, some more detail about uh, what all these properties do without going of course one by one uh, here we have some links at the bottom that will help you having some easy uh, easy to check reference um, but first of all let's just remember i have selected some html elements uh, with the selector we'll come to the selector synthesis later on and once i have selected an element uh, i can choose one or more properties and assign a value to these properties and values uh, uh, well maybe numbers maybe i'm setting the font size so the font size will be a number or maybe i'm setting the text color so uh, i will uh, the value will be a color name or rgb components uh, or maybe i'm setting uh, a style huh? so maybe a border will be uh, solid or will be dashed and so yeah we have enumerated options different possible options that are string values uh, that may apply to that element so every property each one of these 200 property has uh, some allowed values for them so for each property we now we must understand what kind of values that property will accept whether they are numbers whether they are strings whether they are uh, enumerations and uh, usually uh, that property every property has a default value which is set by the browser at the initialization time basically so all the elements already have uh, you can imagine that every html element already has all this property or most of these properties and they already have uh, an initial value so you can basically just modify initial values you cannot create these properties and uh, uh, every property may apply maybe to every element or some properties may only apply to some elements uh, and uh, and so in the documentation of each property we also have the information about uh, whether this property can apply maybe to all block elements or only to line elements uh, or only to uh, form elements for example uh, and so on mm -hmm. so they may apply some of them for example co uh, 
the, the column gap uh, is only apl applicable to column divisions the font variant is only applicable to to um, uh, to flow um, to, uh, to sub paragraph entities or something that uh, is of inline rendering mm -hmm. but we can see the details later and also some properties most of them will be inherited and some of them will not be inherited uh, by all the children uh, imagine for example the the, the white of, of an element uh, say okay this uh, element will be wide uh, 200 pixel and then it will contain other elements inside of course the inside element will be smaller so the white property should not be inherited by the children because otherwise every children will try to be as large as the container so it doesn't make any sense and all of this is in the documentation of these elements uh, just to have a, a, um, a rough idea uh, these are the basic properties uh, the categories in which these properties are defined so these 200 properties are more or less uh, organized in these 20 or so categories um, some of them uh, will be for uh, character properties so fonts font size uh, and, uh, and the type uh, of the font for the single characters and then single characters will aggregate into paragraphs and the text properties will deal with paragraphs basically um, all these uh, um, in, uh, line spacing uh, um, margins and so on of, of, a, of, a, of an entire paragraph we may have tables so a lot of property apply only to tables some of them apply to lists so order list or unordered list will have their own properties to set the margin the spacing the type of bullets and so on uh, all the color properties that will apply to uh, all the text uh, borders uh, uh, and um, and the tables uh, uh, for single text uh, uh, or for background of course usually there are uh, different properties for uh, um, colors of text uh, borders uh, uh, size position color and backgrounds hmm? so they th the three compose actually the the, the, the color co the color palette of, of our of your system and uh, we'll have a lot of uh, discussion also about the dimension the size uh, uh, of the elements and uh, the way they will uh, uh, align hmm? uh, so we can have a look uh, at some of them for example if we just open this page and uh, uh, list the properties i will increase the the size here it lists uh, all the properties by category so let's maybe focus on some of them some of those uh, that are more used uh, uh, the animation properties will find well, something very specific uh, background uh, properties uh, we can decide uh, the background of the whole page of a given paragraph or of a given image or a given table and so on and uh, what you see there is that very often there is a general properties property and then some uh, detailed properties that are uh, obtained by a dash and a specification and this means that uh, uh, usually the general property is a shortcut where you can declare everything that you usually declare in uh, in uh, each of them uh, so for example if you want to fill a, a page or a table or a paragraph with a solid color you can for example background use the background color property uh, that by default is transparent uh, applies to all elements is not inherited usually and uh, the possible value is either a color and then you have all the, the um, definition of how to declare a color in css uh, that will not uh, go into detail uh, like with a color name or rgb value and so on or maybe transparent for example or other keywords like initial or inherited. These are the legal values that this property may have. And here you have some examples. So it's a color, it's an RGB color, it's an RGB color in, uh, in compact format and so on. And here you have all the definitions. So for each of these, uh, um, for each of these properties, you have uh, uh, all the details. If you want to have a background image, okay, it's the same uh, kind of, uh, of uh, declaration and uh, uh, all the different properties like you have a url from which you can allow upload the the image and so on hmm? 
uh, if you have an image maybe this can repeat uh, many times uh, uh, and so you can de decide uh, uh, whether it repeats uh, uh, how many times with what spacing and so on uh, in, in this property so there are a lot of all details uh, borders are uh, the uh, four sides of an element border we'll come back uh, later when we talk about the box model about uh, the the these kind of elements uh, but basically a border of an element uh, uh, as four sides bottom top left and right and uh, they may have a color they may have a style dashed uh, or, or solid for example they may have a width uh, they can be thicker or thinner and uh, a color and so on mm -hmm. so a lot of them will deal with the co with the border for example these very gray lines are borders of cells these ones are thicker and they are borders of this table Color properties are very important, but it's only one property, uh, basically color that will uh, apply the color of a text, only applies to text, uh, all the other elements uh, are dealt by other properties. Uh, dimension properties are for sizing the elements, so the height or the width of an element, uh, the absolute values or the minimum maximum that we allow the, 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 um, the layout algorithms uh, to, to, um, to achieve again when we talk about layout we'll come back to some of these uh, um, details uh, i will skip this one because it's very uh, specific uh, and we will come later on the flexbox layout uh, which are a set of uh, new you see that uh, they are they only apply to css version 3 there are new uh, uh, big set of new attributes that actually are um, providing a totally different way of uh, creating the layout of the page mm -hmm. and it's very uh, they are more modern and more uh, so it's easier to use and more powerful than the classical uh, ways fonts uh, relate to characters so a character is characterized by a family uh, so the, the the type of font basically the size uh, the style that we may be bold maybe italics and so on um lists uh, we may have uh, lists uh, of ballets uh, of numbers of symbols and so on and all the spacing of of, of these symbols uh, and of the lines the margins of the or the, or the different blocks uh, so margins and borders and paddings will go together when we discuss the, the box model multi-column layout properties again apply only to css3 that included uh, for the first time the possibility of flowing the text through di different columns and so we have all the details for this uh, for those uh, uh, um, the outline um, is, uh, is the space uh, beyond the border of an element the padding is a space inside the border of an element it will come there back here when we discuss the box model so that's why i'm skipping there for the moment um also skip the print because we usually don't print pages especially if we are creating applications uh, all the properties about tables and table cells all the properties about this text uh, text means paragraph remember font is a character text is a paragraph hmm? uh, and so uh, paragraphs may be aligned left right uh, justified uh, they may have uh, an indentation they may have uh, um, a separation so how many what the distance between the different lines uh, and so on mm -hmm. so how to put the words together in a paragraph is, is decided by the text properties we may have some transform property if we want to do some some graphical rotations and transformations it's something very uh, again uh, specific uh, or transitions that will uh, uh, let's say be coupled with the animations that we saw at the beginning and uh, and these are visual formatting properties are also very important especially we'll discuss a bit the display um, property that will actually decide uh, where um, where and whether and how a given element is displayed on the page these properties are actually, are actually the controls the handles that that uh, customize the layout algorithm of your page so the layout uh, algorithm of your browser will take into account of of course all the properties but these ones are the most important because they will decide whether a block is drawn or not uh, whether it's drawn uh, at the beginning at the top at the left or the right uh, and so on hmm. especially display and uh, float uh, uh, will be important and we'll discuss them later when we discuss the layout uh, issues so this is ju just a quick overview of the of the properties so that you can get oriented and then you can search for your own uh, 
property when you, when you need uh, some of them, when you need to customize some, some visual property. Uh, as we said, we will focus more on those properties that will affect the layout because the color, for example, are, are very trivial, so very uh, easy to, to, to see by yourselves. So we, these were the properties. Properties may have values and they apply to elements. To which elements do they apply? They apply to those elements that are selected by the CSS selectors. So the other half of the rule, the first half of the rule is a selector. Selectors uh you can imagine uh, them as operators that take the the html tree of the document and def and uh, return you a subset of this tree so they work on the tree they start for the root and do their navigation inside the tree and they highlight some some of the nodes uh, during their their uh, operation and there are different ways different algorithms different methods of highlighting those nodes and these are the main selectors listed here uh, the first selector is easy, is the element selector. So they will select all the elements of a given type. So all the H1, or all the paragraphs, P, or all the images, image. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you, if you just uh, mention the name of an element, all the elements of that type uh, will be selected. Or you can filter the elements by class. Now remember the class properties uh, that we saw in the HTML, and uh, um, uh, every HTML each uh, every HTML element may have one or more classes, and uh, uh, with a class selector we will select all the elements that mention that specific class. The syntax is very easy: class name with a dot uh, in front of it. Or we may select uh, one element by ID. No? If we know the ID of an element uh, with the hash sign. We are selecting specifically that one. This is the only selector that is guaranteed to return zero or one elements. Zero, whether the, if the ID is not present in the page, or one. In the other cases, uh, they can return always uh, more than one element. And this makes this language very powerful because with a very small number of rules, so you can select and then modify the properties of a long batch of elements. Then there are two other attributes that are less used or more specific. One is filtering by attributes. So if you want to uh, only filter those elements whose, uh, that have an attribute of a given name with a given value, just use the syntax. Or there is the pseudo selector that um, so imaging properties over elements. They will not be real properties, but it's something that we'll see them. Uh, some of them they will relate, relate with with what the user is doing with them hmm? but uh, let's go in order the element selector as we said is simply the name of an html element h1 p div image what a as for the links and so on and then the rules will apply to all the elements uh, in the um, uh, matching this element type and depending on the property they will inherit it also to the children or not it depends hmm? or may, we may have a class selectors so in south our html we have some elements uh, maybe a paragraph maybe a, a heading marked the same with a given class you see that the class uh, the same class name applies to different types of elements p with a class h3 with the same class as before it doesn't matter uh, they are they are all different HTML elements and all of them will be selected by this selector dot blue text We will select everything dot means class remember dot is equal to class class blue text and so to both of them I will apply this color blue attribute the uh, declaration that will change to blue the value of the color attribute the same goes for ID, so the syntax is very similar. Uh, the, we are only just using the hash sign inside the, instead of the dot a symbol, and we'll match uh, one, only one element with that specific ID. Mm -hmm. So the mechanism is the same. It, of course, it's simpler because it will only match one element. It, is, it, doesn't, uh, it only checks this attribute, it doesn't check the element type. Mm -hmm. And then there are these pseudo selectors that uh, may modify may match some specific property for example the a element uh, is a link and you can uh, change some properties depending on whether the fact that this link is 
is already visited or, or was not or was not visited before or the mouse is hovering over it or the button uh, the uh, mouse button is is being clicked and so on or maybe uh, so uh, depending on whether the, the link is visited or not and whether you are clicking it or not or, or whether you are hovering your mouse on top of that you can change the property may, may, for example you can change the color hmm? uh, or you can change the, the the color property to the same value so maybe you suppress some different than they may be for example uh, you may change the background color of a table row whenever your mouse is on on hovering over that over that row and so on so these pseudo uh, selectors uh, actually um, select a, a, an element and then uh, consider it only whether some specific condition is happening right now usually there are dynamic properties that depend on the user actions um, okay going to the fin we finish our uh, list of uh, uh, type of selectors the attribute selector we say that the attribute is equal to value and then there are other uh, more specific operator that just uh, uh, do approximate matching uh, uh, with the in, uh, string containment and string beginning and so on but uh, uh, we, uh, we don't need to, to spend uh, much, too much time to, to go into this detail and so we have these um, uh, five main type of selectors element class ID attributes and pseudo and they can be combined hmm? they be, can be combined together with a very simple syntax basically elements class and id and attributes can be combined together so i can write element dot class or element slash id or dot class slash id, um, hash ID or what, whatever combination i want and of course all of them will be combined and will be filtered together so it will be ended like a logical end between the different uh, um, selectors so it's a inter uh, an intersection between the sets and this will give me a more restrictive selector than just the element one or just the class one so only the uh, p element that have the, the blue uh, property for example the blue class and uh, each of these expressions can be further combined with some simple operators like the space means that uh, i'm selecting all the selector two if they are nested within selector one so only the p that are inside the table for example mm -hmm. uh, or uh, all the p that, that are directly inside the table so if they are the, the first the first children uh, the difference between space and the greater sign is that the greater sign only consider immediate children while the space consider also the nested children and children of children and children of children children and so on so anywhere nested inside this one there will be an s2 and it will be nested uh, here inside this one they should be directly immediately nested uh, an s2 and not uh, nested into and in the, at the second or third or fourth levels and so on uh, these other two operators are order operators so s2 it comes after s1 it's not inside it's not nested it comes after s1 is finished after the end of s1 there will be an s2 it's less used uh the the, the first, these two ones are the most used one the nesting one and the direct nesting one there's also a comma operator which just uh, it's a shortcut uh, for the union so instead of writing two rules uh, one for s1 and one for s2 is the two declarations are the same you can just join the uh the selector together so this uh, simple table tries to uh give some basic example uh to the application of these rules uh, which are the you see that there are only four or five rules it's a very, it's a very simple language but they can be combined in a very uh, complex way hmm? um, because each of them can be rich uh, it's not just an element maybe a class maybe uh, an id and so on hmm? okay uh, so again uh, the selectors work on html elements uh, and uh, whenever it's possible we should uh, uh, use uh, meaningful HTML elements. It will also be easier to select them, uh, easier to identify them. It's not just any div, but it's a section, it's an article 
or in any case try to give meaningful class names uh, to uh, to the elements uh, and uh, when, when everything else fails uh, use a div or a span with a with a meaningful name again so, so something that's easy to remember and really um, tells you what is really happening in your page and also remember that in html elements may be block level elements or inline elements uh, uh, that will change a lot uh, the way we are processing them at the layout stages hmm? uh, remember block elements uh, go uh, from top to bottom and in line boxes uh, in line elements uh, go from left to right and they can wrap around uh, when the line is finished hmm? like the words in a paragraph and the block level are like the paragraphs in a page hmm? um, so for example we have four different uh, ways uh, of uh, of creating a, a block uh, using a, a div and uh, we give an id to this div to this division called main navigation and this main navigation will contain a list uh, with the names of the uh, of the um, of the main menu of the page hmm? uh, this list uh, we, we imagine it, uh, it to be an, an an ordered list so it should be a bullet list like this one but we can transform it later into an horizontal list of elements uh, with the uh, with the proper background to look like buttons or to look like uh, section headings um, this same maybe can be rewritten uh, by sparing this id this id is actually um, useless because we could uh, just use the ul and give the id to the ul uh, if, if we don't need this id for anything else uh, maybe it's one layer too much uh, you can spare this level or maybe you can remember that uh, uh, the main navigation already has an HTML semantic elements attached to that. So we can describe it uh, with nav. And the unordered list can also be called menu. Um, and it will behave like an unordered list, but will uh, specifically describe that this is going to be an, uh, a list of command options uh, available for you. So these are more or less the same um they represent the same uh, uh, structure of, of a page the same meaning uh, uh, in in different ways of course hmm? by different approaches probably the the last one is is the cleanest one because it, it uh, relies on the embedded semantics of html5 but also the other one works equally well of course in this case i, use, I must use a um, um a class uh, an id selector here i can use an id selector and here i can just use a nav element selector for selecting all these parts of the page um, and the same goes with the span element uh, that is used to identify the, some portion of a of a paragraph uh, so i can mark this uh, with class equal to date so that we can maybe um, draw or uh, highlight dates in some way uh, but in this case we remember that uh, uh, html has a time element that, that is actually has the same purpose uh, and so we can use that why for example in marking this with this guy with the class author because maybe I want to format the authors uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a specific way but uh, unfortunately HTML doesn't have any specific class for authors so I will keep the span by uh, using the explicit class declaration mm -hmm. and so in this case I will select this date with the time element selector and the second one with the author class selector uh, so again when possible try to uh, avoid divs anonymous divs and use the semantic elements but otherwise there's nothing bad from except for readability of using both so you can use both of them um, I, I mentioned the display property uh, before and uh, uh, the display property will change the way a block is interpreted so for example usually a, a list item a list uh, will display their elements uh, one below the other so if i have a bullet list so an ul an order list uh, all the different list elements will be of block type so they will come one after the other but if i'm trying to build the main navigation of a website imagine the first uh, bar of a website where you have all the sections headings well uh, this is a list usually it's declared as a list but we tell the list that their elements should come from left to right in, instead of to, from top to bottom so in this case 
we can modify the display algorithm for the list items by saying they should be displayed in line so the, we are transforming a block element into an inline element and we can also do the reverse uh, it's less useful uh, transforming a, a, an inline element into a block level element so we are changing the layout algorithm from the default one where lists are uh, vertical elements uh, into horizontal formatting and vice versa so if we have many many images usually images are uh, inline elements they they just um, uh, position themselves uh, left to right if i change the, the display property to block they will start uh, uh, going uh, one uh, below the other hmm? uh, so this display attribute is very uh, powerful because in, it has a very big impact uh, and transformation over the layout of a given type of element or of set of elements uh, that we selected with the selector and uh, the display has also sp a special value which is none huh? so uh, we can display an element in line we can display an element as a block or we can just don't display it any, uh, at all so we, we can set display uh, property to none and in that case this element will disappear from the page like it never existed we can actually prune a part of the html trees and, and make it disappear so all the browser will behave like that part uh, of the page uh, uh, doesn't exist and this is very useful because we can have uh, some part of an html page ready for you for example a pop-up box or, or some uh, details uh, um, uh, pop-up or, or a frame where you have, you have already the page prepared with that content but in this in this moment you don't need to show it and so uh, you can just make it hidden so display none makes a, a given part hidden you have a, a region in your page for error messages but right now you don't have any error to display and so what you do you just hide this part out you don't delete the html par part you don't really delete the element because you will need it later maybe and so you just make it invisible actually there are two ways of making an element invisible one is the with the hidden property and the other is the sorry with the display property and the other is the with, with the visibility property the difference is that the display none really deletes or behaves like the element was never there in the html pass tree while the visibility hidden uh, formats the element and uh, doesn't display it uh, but the element will take space mm -hmm. uh, will take the same space as before uh, so you will see an empty space in your page and that empty space is where the element would have been if it was visible uh, in the other case uh, it, uh, it will be uh, removed and the space will be used for something else mm -hmm. so it depends on what uh, you want to achieve you can play with these two with visibility attributes there are one is called display and the other is called visibility here i just try to collect uh, some uh, pseudo class selectors i won't uh, spend more uh, much time um, in in, um, in describing them you can you can have a look uh, there are as you see some specifications about uh, uh, what is uh, uh, some specific properties of some elements uh, whether for example an, an input element as a focus uh, or you have the first letter of a, of a paragraph or the first line of a paragraph or a first child of an element so you want to format something where the first row is different from the others and so on so uh, there are um, quick ways uh, of uh, selecting some elements uh, uh, or counting also the third or last children or, or seven three children or of an odd uh, you want to format them in a specific way or the even odd rows should be formatted with a different color and so on so there are uh, very detailed and there are a lot of possibilities um, so the basic mechanism is there we have the selectors the five main type of selectors and the combinations how, would, how you can combine them and uh, the uh, properties the 200 or more properties that can be used and can be modified and now it's time to ask ourselves uh, uh, what happens if more than one rule so one, the one declaration will match a given element this is where the cascading takes into place 
so there are the cascading rules that, that us that we may apply many styles uh, to the same html document html3 document and uh, uh, when many rules apply to the same element uh, there is a given a very clear priority uh, the lowest priority is the browser default style so every element already has a, a default style given by the browser usually it's black text over a white background but not doesn't necessarily be uh, usually they the browser applies some margins but maybe not all the browsers apply the same value of margin and so on it's just the default okay and uh, uh, this is uh, what happens if you don't use css at all is these are the styles that you get so you write a title that uh, the heading one will be bigger than a heading two and will be bigger by um, than a paragraph text why because the browser already has some default styles for all the uh, properties then we can apply an external style uh, which is uh, basically a, a css file linked in the document in the page uh, so uh, the normal way of uh, of inserting of applying a style sheet to an html page is that the html page in the heading section has a link statement saying i want to link to this page this specific style sheet of type css with the role of uh, of style sheet itself so in this case this css file is being read and which be is being applied to the body so in this case we have an element selector h1 that will apply to this h1 element and a selector h2 that will apply to this h2 element and so on and this will be a, uh, of course override this uh, the declaration in this in this external side uh, style will be will override the declarations uh, given by the browser so we'll re change what the browser will display and uh, it's also possible to uh, have an internal style i want i don't recommend it very much so directly inside the head of the element we put the declaration so we don't need an external file a second extra file with the declaration we put the css inside the html i don't like to mix languages very much and especially if there are some styles that are common to all the pages in your website you we would need to replicate them all over the pages but it's a possibility that technically is possible and technically it has higher priority than the first one and also the last uh, possibility of applying a style to a document uh, is using the style attribute you remember when we discussed html with we, we, we say that uh, the style attributes is can be is defined for every html element and is used to uh, de declare a snippet of css like this one that will apply specifically only to this element so you don't need a selector here because it's implicit that this style will apply to this element and only to this one and you only have the declarations uh, property value property value property value and so on again uh, it this one has a la the highest priority than the others uh, but uh, it's very it's, it's like embedding the presentation attributes inside the html uh, file so it's not very clean uh, from a, from an architectural point of view so you, you can use it but ju just as a last resort maybe to change one specific element uh, when it's not worth declaring a rule matching only that element and then so and then i'm not so sure that it will i I would do it uh, in this way and again so there are some uh, priority rules uh, that uh, are summarized by this picture so the browser styles uh, the author styles uh, that can be in external or internal uh, style sheets uh, or inline styles applied to uh, elements uh, this picture is more complex it also, it also lists user styles because a user could theoretically customize their browsers by loading a style sheets uh, different default style sheets so instead of using the browser default styles um, a user a given user uh, on their computer on their browser may install some custom styles these styles will override the browser ones uh, but will be over overwritten by the author styles that are the ones of the web page creators okay um, and uh, uh, with the 
these rules, uh, the external rules, uh, you can have uh, uh, also an internal priority between the different rules. Uh, so if the rules are, are more or less specific, uh, so being more specific means adding uh, uh, more specification, restricting the number of elements. Uh, so the more specific rules uh, that apply only to one element are applied at a higher priority over the general rules that apply to, I don't know, all the body, all the paragraphs, and so on. Uh, and if the specificity, specificity is the same, uh, the latest uh, declared wins over the previous ones. And uh, as a last resort, after inline styles, we can have also author styles uh, that override the inline styles, uh, so they can be external, if they are marked with the important attribute. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we do very, uh, very rarely when we really don't want any rule uh, to, or to override a given important style. So we have a hierarchy of styles, uh, what uh, our work is mainly here on external uh, styles. Uh, usually many many designers uh, the first thing they do is to reset browser styles to a default so they they know what they are working with and then redefine every aspect of the page here um, so this specificity uh, like is mentioned here is actually a very complex algorithm if you look at the at the specification it's actually very complex because uh, uh, it will um, decide which rule is more specific than another so it should have a higher priority to be applied and actually we count uh, id selectors are more specific than class selectors class selectors are more specific than type selectors but it also depends on how many type selectors you have how many classes how many ids and so on and you have this nice picture if you want to go to the web website you can zoom it uh, that will try to uh, tell you depending on the selector uh, matching everything matching an element, uh, matching a direct child, uh, matching a set, uh, an A inside a P, inside an I, and so on, uh, how many elements are matched, and these numbers, 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, uh, and so on, Z, 2, 0, 1, are a sort of a specificity score, and the higher score will win, in a way. So if you ever need to uh, solve some conflicts and understand why some rule is winning over another one, you can refer to this uh, diagram. Uh, okay, right now we come to the, the most uh, probably uh, particular, uh, let's say, topic uh, about CSS. So right now it was just a, a way of applying attributes, uh, but right now we we'll start to understand uh, the effect uh, of, this, uh, of these attributes. Um, the, this box model is a strange name. CSS box model means that uh, 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 the layout engine of every browser thinks uh, uh, of a page like a set of boxes and these boxes are all the same have all the same structure a title is a box a paragraph of text is a box an image is a box a single letter is a box every HTML element is mapped to a visual box in some cases some elements are just invisible but they are there okay so imagine the uh, HTML tree, every node in the uh, HTML tree is a box. And the box, uh, when uh, turned into a layout, uh, um, occupies some physical space. And this physical space occupied by the box uh, is uh, obtained by the sum of three different layers. The innermost layer is the content. So if I'm, for, if I'm printing the letter A, the content will be the space occupied by the letter A with that font, with that font size, with that font style. So maybe maybe eight pixel wide by ten pixel high. If I'm displaying an image, the content will occupy exactly the space given that by the pixel of that image. If I'm displaying a paragraph, well, the content will be. Uh, the full width of the page, so the, 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 the white of the content will be the white of the page, and the height of the content depends on the number of lines uh, that the paragraph contains, and so on. But every element has uh, their own space that they need to display. So it's a bottom-up property. I'm formatting an element here, and so this element will, will occupy this space, no matter what I like or not. 
and then uh, all the other elements can be just invisible so or, or, of uh, size zero or may have a size different than zero a positive size greater than zero and these three elements are the border a border is something that is can be drawn around the element and can have a, a thickness can we a zero pixel border so it's invisible or one pixel or two pixel or ten pixel border and it's drawn around the element the border may have a color or it's of itself and the style of course but let's reason about the colors first of all and uh, uh, the border uh, outside of the border will still have a margin a margin is a space where the element uh, will not overlap with other elements hmm? so it's an empty space so if i have a margin different by zero different elements will not will not touch okay uh, the the end of the border of one element uh, will not touch the beginning of the border of the other because we still have some margin some minimum distance between the elements it may be zero may be different by zero and we also have some spacing between the border and their real content and this internal space like an internal margin is called padding so from a given content imagine the letter a we can add some internal padding some border with a specific thickness and some margin and the sum of all these content plus padding plus border plus margin is the real space occupied on the page that will be used for by the layout algorithm left to right if this is an inline component and top to bottom if this is a um, block component right uh, what you can see here is also the colors uh, usually the padding shares the same background color with the content the margin shares the same background content uh, color as the container as the outside world so the color of the margin is the color of the outside we cannot color a margin the color margin depends on the larger element that includes me uh, i can decide my color for the content and the same color will also be used for the padding while the border may have a color by itself it's a different one can be different from the inside and can be different from the margin color every element contains these uh, numbers uh, and if you go into the inspector in your browser you will see and you select an element you will see this number so this is the, the content size with a padding of 40 in the top and 40 in the left with a border of 5 in the four uh, sides and the margin of 40 these are very large paddings and margin numbers in pixels you see that the uh, numbers on the four sides are, are diff uh, in this case they are identical but they are listed on the four sides means that uh, we can customize each one of these numbers separately so the difference between the 300 by 150 box here and the real space um, taken on the page by this element uh, it depends on the sum of this element so we'll, this will be 45 plus 45 on every side so 90 uh, pixels more so actually on the page this element will occupy uh 390 by uh, 240 pixels uh, height so we can with css we can uh we have these three uh three six nine and twelve numbers we can um, tweak them individually uh, to obtain what uh, the effect that we want uh, to obtain so we are drawing some space around the content uh, if we didn't have any padding or margin all the element will be will just be everything uh, together with, with uh, the page will be really unreadable there's no uh, you, you see the spacing is important to understand uh, uh, the text uh, to understand the content so it's very important to set the right spacing to give the meaning uh, the visual meaning visual interpretation to the content and this for a single element when different elements are combined together well the layout uh, algorithm for css will uh, um, actually employ different uh, positioning methods hmm? so the positioning is uh, what happens after the blocks the boxes have been created and now the browser is asking okay where do i put this box and where I put the other, this other box relative to the first one again there's a uh, uh, there are different uh, possibilities 
uh, there are in uh, HTML four main positioning algorithms uh, statics relative absolute and fixed uh, plus flow that will come later because it was invented uh, only after CSS3 came out um, basically in the static uh, positioning scheme uh, is the default one all the inline elements are left to right and all the block elements are top to bottom with the with no strange uh, variations just by using the space that they need to fit then we have the relative that can move a block with respect to the static one and absolute and fixed can that uh, uh, define the the real position of the element uh, uh, independently from the others uh, that are around uh, so as we say the static uh, formatting only uses the basic uh, algorithm that uh, where block levels uh, uh, boxes go from top to bottom and uh, uh, the position of the elements uh, is defined by the position of the html code so uh, by default uh, an, em an element that is uh, appears later in the html will be shown later so more to the right or more to the bottom in the page inline boxes are uh, again set uh, from left to right uh, or also by uh, taking into account the padding margins and borders and everything else um, this was the basic and then we came to uh, some, uh, uh, some more advanced uh, formatting relative positioning so attribute position to relative uh, it can be used to shift an element uh, by a given number of pixels with respect to the initial position. So uh, the browser will initially position all the elements by default uh, in the default rule with the static rules and then move this one away. All the other ones uh, will not move uh, and uh, uh, they will behave like uh, the elements still was in the uh, initial position. Uh, it is, this can be used, for example, if you want to do some drag and drop or some animation uh, of elements in this case um, the absolute position uh, is different in that uh, it will uh, take the element totally out of the formatting so the other elements the green the the yellow ones here will be formatted by ignoring this one so this one will not have the place uh, the space for itself and uh, we just define the absolute position with respect to the containers with respect to the div that will contain uh, this element mm -hmm. uh, so we'll always have the same position and we might also overlap over the others and the others will behave like this one was not there so will be applied on top and later with respect to the other elements and there's very a specific way of uh, uh, absolute positioning is the uh, is the fixed position where uh, the coordinates are decided uh, co with, with respect to the browser window and not with respect to the page content hmm? uh, they are very complex uh, and especially in the way they interact with each other we are not spending really too much time uh, to go into detail about these uh, positioning schemes uh, because we will use later some frameworks uh, that will try to do the right thing without us knowing all the details about these positioning schemes of course the uh, positioning also depends uh, on the on the order in which the elements are displayed so whenever something overlaps uh, who is on who is on top of whom and this is decided by a z index which usually is managed by the browser but again we can uh, change the z, z index property in uh, with our css to make an element go uh, in the front or in the back of the page so all the aspects of this uh, uh, layout algorithm can be controlled by our properties uh, and they can unfortunately they can interact with each other in very complex ways there's also some exceptions to the normal uh, positioning algorithm when we want uh, some elements to uh, to float uh, to the left or to the right of a page so imagine uh, if you have some text and you want an image to be on the side of the text and the text to float around okay to be formatted around so in that case we have this float algorithm that is able to take the the image which usually is an inline element so the image would be inside the text here it will just shift uh, to the full right of the of the containing element or to the full left and then every other element will be laid out, laid out uh, around it 
and uh, this was easy for images but can also be used for something bigger so we can also float entire boxes of text uh, we can float entire sections and this is the way how we create multi-column websites so we float the menu to the left we float the article to the le left and we float uh, the related the topics to the right of the page uh, like in this case and so in this way we are creating different big portion of the page uh, that are uh, shifted around or left right uh, depending on these uh, uh, float attributes mm. and uh, there's also the inverse of the float is the clear command uh, that says okay let's finish all these floats and start again with the full width of the, of the page uh, uh, without uh, the risk of having a floating element overwrite some some text uh, the floats uh, the controlling the floats is a, is a um, powerful but low level mechanism there are a lot of guys that will tell you how to create a two column and three column website using floats we'll see some of them in the next uh, uh, lecture and uh, um, but uh, again we won't need uh, not to go into much detail because we will use in some css frameworks but in some cases you need to control something more directly and so you just remember that these positioning schemes uh, well, the four one the, uh, uh, the, the 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 default one the relative uh, absolute and fixed uh, and all the uh, floatings to left and right uh, uh, can help you install some particular condition if your framework uh, is not able to give you the layout uh, uh, that you really want and uh, so at this point we are so closing this uh, first part of the of the CSS class uh, and the next part will be uh, about how we apply all that we learned uh, into a real page layout so how to obtain the layout we want using these uh, uh, commands but especially using the bootstrap framework will be, that will be very powerful to us so let's uh, continue that on the next video